have fun. Thanks. <clears throat>
but thank you, Jörg. Uh, good morning. Um, yeah, well, in a barrier uh, in Australia, we've got uh, 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 Australia, Australia third uh, barrier that has been uh, going since I think it's 2000. I only started in 2009 um, with it. Um, Uh, so that is um, uh, yeah, basically a consortium of Australian uh, herbaria that have been uh, uh, trying to collate all the data together and get it uh, accessible from one point. Um, we've got um, yeah, in 2008 we became part of the Atlas of Living Australia. And, uh, things, uh, uh, that was when AVH uh, really took off. Um, we start. Uh, we started with um, uh, eight uh, uh, state and territory Commonwealth area. Uh, so which is all the all the capitals of the states uh, and territories. Um, since uh, 2005, we have been using the uh, the biocase provider for uh, exchanging data or uh, delivering data to uh, AVH. Uh, took a long time to get uh, everything sorted out. So, uh, uh, so basically, uh, from two, uh, 2005, we only had two providers, and. Uh, uh, in 2010, uh, Jörg came uh, helping us out and he visited all Australia barrier and set up uh, biocase providers down uh, there. Uh, so now I think we have six, uh, six biocase providers with, um, uh, and that delivered 10, uh, yeah, 10 data resources and um, uh, Yeah, at the maximum we had about uh, we had thirteen. Um, I was supposed. I can't see the controls. Niels, Andrea is controlling your presentation. So if you just oh, yeah. next slide when you want the next one. Thank you. Easy. Um, uh, so, uh, what I like about uh, uh, the biocase provider, about uh, biocase advantages, and the first thing is the, uh, the fact that you can query it, uh, which, is, uh, which allows us to um, uh, deliver data dynamically, uh, as in deliver what you want and when you want it. Uh, so, that allows us to do uh, uh, incremental updates so uh, send only data that has been updated from a sin uh, from a particular date and that is uh, uh, yeah that allows us to do very frequent delivery which was big for us of, uh, uh, before we uh, became part of uh, AVH we were delivering uh, every day and people wanted to be uh, and before that, it was actually federated, so it was in real time. Uh, so people, uh, yeah, collections people find it very uh, important that the collection is up to date every time. So the frequent uh, delivery was very important to us. It's a little bit less important now. And the other big thing of it is the safe bandwidth, which was a really big thing uh, for us, uh, especially for my organization. We didn't have a lot of that, and we couldn't. Um, there was no way we could uh, send uh, data to uh, uh, that quick. So another example is uh, um, uh, that we can, uh, uh, yeah, flexible uh, data structure mapping. Uh, so no star scheme, we can do with everyone. I, I thought I'd go quite over the top with my with the number of tables until I saw your presentation yesterday with, uh, much more, um, but uh, so this is our uh, uh, data model. That, uh, but uh, on the other hand, uh, a lot of our providers have just one or two uh, tables as well. 
you have the next slide. Uh, yeah. So, and the other thing uh, is the is the schema mapper or uh, the way you uh, uh, you map your uh, uh, your database fields to uh, uh, to A B C D. And I, I actually find that that's the you know, easiest way to learn to understand uh, uh, a rather complex uh, schema. So this is just a screenshot of a little bit of uh, A B C D. Yeah, the next slide. Uh, and the other thing is the uh, the configuration with the um, with the uh, uh, through the CMF files. Um, so this allows us to uh, uh, gives us the ability to extend the schema. So you can see on the uh, on the right the extension that I have put in. Uh, which is basically all the diamond core fields that I thought weren't sufficiently covered in uh, in ABCD, or some uh, are sufficiently covered, but uh, they are in the named areas or the measurement of X. Uh, and that for some uh, have area that is uh, difficult to deliver. So I added all the other ones. Um, you can also. Uh, um, you also have the ability to uh, uh, to create an entirely a new schema based on access uh, on the XSD file. So we did that uh, with HisPet, which is uh, um, which is, ba is based on ABCD, but I put it in another uh, into another namespace uh, because uh, they wanted to. Uh, to get all their uh, uh, controlled vocabularies in. And uh, uh, so Jörg uh, made a CMS file for us. And uh, about half the barrier are, uh, are using that. So I myself still use, uh, I, I use uh, ABCD itself. Um, validation, uh, validation beyond XSD. So, uh, so that's how I get, uh, I, for instance, get some of the HISPIT uh, vocabularies in because I can do it in the CMS file, even if it's not in the CMD file. And you can do the same thing uh, in your enumerator. You can also have mappings. So um, uh, you can, um, uh, yeah, map, uh, map values in your database to other values in the, uh, uh, in your in your ABCD, so for instance, we did that for the. I think families are uh, the, the the ranks are in, in Latin in the ABCD for Caribbean, and we have them in English in the uh, in the data in the database. And uh, you know, we are botanists, so you, we use division rather than phylum, and that sort of thing. Uh, next slide, please. Oh, that will be the last one already. Um, uh, there are all uh, there are also some things that could be uh, considered disadvantages, uh, and mostly how other people uh, perceive it. I think uh, it needs a certain level of geekishness to uh, to like the the biocap files that people find hard to set up and use, and uh, uh, yeah, not everybody likes XML as much as I do. Uh, the next one is actually wrong. I found out yesterday. I thought it might not work for all XML schemas that had a certain uh, shape, but uh, Jörg said that it worked for everything. So I thought I'd better check. And there's actually a, there's a CMF file for TCS already. So I might try that out at some point. Um, yeah, harvesting for a lot of people is even more difficult than. Uh, uh, and then setting up to provide and deliver it. Um, so ALA doesn't want to touch it at all, uh, for instance. So I've been harvesting all the biocase providers for the last eight years, which was great for me because I got to work with ALA. <laughs> um, it's, uh, uh, it, it becomes a bit of a problem uh, now, so we actually, uh, we're actually moving away from the bar cage provider now, which I 
yeah, I find it a little shame, but uh, um, if it's, um, uh, yeah, it's more important what the people uh, uh, that you, uh, uh, yeah, the consumers of your data want if, uh, uh, yeah, if people can't consume it and it's, uh, there's not too much point of uh, setting it up. I, I, I see a lot of uh, use for the bio case still in the exchange between Herbaria, but I have to see if all the Herbaria uh, still see it as well. And, uh, Two minutes. Yeah. The, Great, right, thank you. I'm actually done. The, the other thing is uh, <laughs> that it's too slow for the, uh, for the big aggregators uh, and uh, that has been covered all, uh, already. It takes me uh, about seven hours to do a complete, uh, complete load and that's when the tables are already set up and uh, you know, the Darwin core, uh, the, the IPT takes uh, takes two and a half minutes or something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, so that's it for me. Thank, thanks, Thank Nias. I think Jerk had pretty much everything covered already, but I, <laughs> I wrote the uh, no. presentation before I heard that. So. No, thanks. It's nice to hear, to hear this from someone who uses it because the other one is our perspective as um, the developers. And it's nice to hear that someone's that actually someone is enjoying looking at ABCD <laughs> because you usually find it scary. Um, you're the first one to enjoy this. <laughs> I've uh, looked at it for a long time. That's the. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely was scary in the beginning. Yeah. Um, yeah, um, maybe that's um, something uh, for um, the discussion now, because um, you mentioned that um, what you think is especially useful that you can use by case to request um, only a subset of the of the data set, um, for example, for ex incremental updates. So I would like to, um, to ask um, the discussion or the group, um, how do you Think about this. So, is it for you important to be able to retrieve just a subset um, of the data set, or do you prefer to um, <clears throat> to produce dumps of the whole data set and reharvest and ingest this um, completely because um, bandwidth and um, processing power is not an issue anymore? How do you feel about this? No opinions. People are writing in chat. If anyone wishes to speak, uh, could you please just use the raised hand? I have Christian. Christian raises his hand, right? Christian? Oh, I was muted, sorry. Uh, I, I've been using the, the Biocast wrapper in the, in the past, and um, actually, I never really understood why there's such a big um, discrepancy between the performance of the bio case and um, ABCD uh, and Darwin Core, for example. Could you just give a bit of a background on, on that, on technical background? Yeah, I can try. Um, well, bio case um, and ABCD are XML based. So for every record, for every specimen, a bio case needs to produce one XML document. So um, what it does, well, there are two things. On the, on the input side, you don't have a flat file with one row for every occurrence. You have um, several tables. So BioCase um, uses um, a SQL statement with joins to draw the data from all the tables. And this might result in a very huge data set because for all the, um, the tables that have repetitions, you multiply the, the input um, data set. So for 100 records, uh, for 100 specimens, you might have um, like 10,000 um, rows in the um, input um, um, 
results it. And then Biocase has to go through all these data and construct 100 XML um, documents. That's what's taking a lot of time. Um, the IPT just writes out um, one row per record and um, that's of course faster. Was that somehow understandable, Christian? Um, yes, but um, still, are you looking into a solution for that, like parallelization, or um, I don't know, you, you probably well, optimize you, indexing um, <clears throat> all the things well, you could do. If we stick to XML in the future, we have to think to think about uh, parallelizing this, of course, because when biocase um, of development began like 20 years ago, um, huge data sets were not the case. So most data sets had um, a few uh, thousand or tens of thousands of records. So this was not an issue. But it, if we stick to XML, of course, we have to think about this in the future version. Um, but um, well, that's one of the open questions, whether XML is still the, the right uh, format for serial, serializing um, occurrences. It's one of the questions in the, uh, in the IDS paper. So it might, very likely in my opinion, XML is, is not the best way of um, exporting uh, huge data sets, whole data sets anymore. Thank you for your question. It's prompted a lot of discussion on the chat around IPT users. Um, and there's a lot of IPT users I saw earlier in this chat commenting that being able to sub-select on the IPT data would be useful. Um, can, can I ask a question um, to the BioClase folks? Um, are there more tools being written on top of the BioCase network than simply just writing to, that's like publishing to aggregators like GBIF or the ALA? Well, there used to be the annotation, or there is the annotation tool. Um, which is used in the biocast portal. Um, this uses, or this, this is focused on ABCD, so you can annotate on individual um, ABCD elements. Um, unfortunately, that's not used um, excessively, we have to admit. Um, but that was one tool that was definitely um, developed on top of biocase for use with ABCD. Thanks, Jörg. Uh, we, we have Falco and, and Ben with their hands up. Falco, could you go first, please? Yeah, thanks. Yeah, there's also a tool called uh, the Biocase Monitor Service uh, that makes uh, extensive use um, of the uh, Biocase um, network, especially the, the Biocase uh, um, protocol. And so this tool is used to pre-aggregate the data uh, for uh, checking the consistency um, and uh, partially also the quality of the data before publishing. And this makes uh, extensive use of the querying functions of Biocase and helps local networks a lot. Thanks, Falco. Yeah, something I can add on this, maybe. Um, what um, the BIOCAS protocol cannot only be used to, to request records, a subset of records, um, but also to inspect um, certain data items, for example, with a capabilities request, as it's called. You can ask a BIOCAS installation um, to get a list of all um, um, scientific names of all identification results. So you will see um, a list of what's inside the database or geographic coverage. You can get a list of all um, countries, or stuff like that, or all gathering agents, all collectors. And that's something you can do with a biocase monitor. So you can easily inspect certain items um, of the ABCD standard. Yeah, I've actually used that tool quite a lot, especially, you know, when you get all the providers and um, uh, delivering uh, data to, uh, uh, especially to, so, uh, you know, what types of named areas they've got or uh, what type of, uh, how do they call the, <laughs> their types of uh, uh, 
you know, measurement of text. Yeah. Uh, Two minutes. Okay, hear from Ben, please. Uh, there was, a while. Yeah, right, right. I've seen that. So uh, just a quick question. So what do you see as being the viable alternative to XML? I mean, XML has a huge advantage. I'm sure it's complex, but it has a, the advantage of doing complex, defined complex data types, for example, which JSON cannot do. What do you see as being a viable alternative to XML if you want a different direction? Other than JSON, I think is probably the other one, but is there, is there a third way? Well, I guess um, maybe RDF is an option for the future. And um, it's also a question, maybe there should be different output formats for different purposes. So if you want to have certain records, individual records, then XML might be an option because performance is not the issue. But if you want right. to harvest the whole data set, then CSV or frictionless data might be better suitable. Definitely XML is not the right format for um, ingesting or for harvesting millions of records. That's, that's for sure. Just because of size, I mean, basically size is the way you go yeah. on that just because it's just too, and, big, uh, it's too just robust. The, yeah. Just the, the, the amount of processing you need to construct the XML documents and then to deconstruct <laughs> and harvest. Yeah. It's just too bad, isn't it? You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> I think raw data people would probably always like XML if it was a little you know, easier to use and quicker. You know. Thank you. I would just like to ask one more question before we move on, um, if that's okay, Laura, with time. And sure. it's a question to, to Niels. Neil, so earlier in the chat, I put a link to the uh, AVH portal, um, which is run by the ALA infrastructure. I, I'm curious, how much do you use the, the portal that's provided by ALA to explore the AVH network? And how much do you actually rely on Biocase to query um, other institu uh, institutions data directly? Uh I don't use the biocache for fire to uh, 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 to uh, uh, query all the institutions that and everything goes to uh, to IVH. But as a, as a user, if you're searching for something, do you go to that portal or do you just go straight to the providers? No, I could, uh, we all go uh, straight uh, to uh, to the portal. Okay. I'm the only one who can harvest, uh, <laughs> who can look at biocase providers in that. That's not true. We do a lot of uh, biocase crawling at GBIF as well. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Niels. Um, so are there any more opinions on biocase or the AVH? So we just move on to the next presentation which is from David Bloom by BirdNet, right? And he will tell us um, about their uses of the IPT in BirdNet. All right, good morning, folks. Well, good morning here, good afternoon, good evening, good middle of the night for some of you. Are you able to see the screen share now? Yes, yes that's good. All right, so uh, just to start, um, I'd like to thank Ted Wig and, and all of this year's conference sponsors for supporting uh, the community in this meeting this year. It's, it's crazy circumstances, so it's really excellent to see, see faces and hear voices, even though we're all separated. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to talk to you uh, today about the VertNet experience with the IPT. And to do that, I need to give you a little bit of... Um, VertNet's been using the IPT ever since we started mobilizing and publishing data back in the old and olden days. Uh, right now we have 275 public data sets on the VertNet IPT, plus a whole bunch of others in various stages of mobilization just waiting to go public. Uh, in all, we've probably published more than 400 data sets from more than 200 different data publishers on the VertNet IPT. Uh, the SPREP IPT in Samoa, uh, and a handful of other data sets on other IPTs in various places. 
Uh, we also help to maintain several of those IPTs on a spectrum of support ranging from regular maintenance to simply answering questions when asked. Um, so not only does the VertNet IPT support hundreds of data sets, uh, we also provide direct access to this publishing tool for more than 200 individual resource managers. So the IPT needs to be easy enough to use levels of understanding of the data publishing process and of technology. <clears throat> so we help people from a wide range of institutions, uh, backgrounds and regions to publish their data. And as it happens, uh, pretty much people from every continent uh, have used our training IPT, which is an excellent tool. That test mode is really uh, an excellent thing. Uh, one thing you should know is that we tend to manage our IPT a little differently. Uh, and that it, in most cases, uh, we're the ones who do the upload and linking uh, of data to the IPT. We perform the mappings and we usually start the metadata, often 50%, uh, 60% of the metadata uh, before any of the data managers actually log in. Uh, we do this to make it as simple as possible for the data publishers so that when the resource managers do log in, all they need to do is confirm our data linkages and all with very specific and, and minimal instructions from us. So, uh, uh, when we say that we, uh, um, uh, that we, that we like the IPT, and we do like the IPT, we like it for two primary reasons. Uh, the first is that we like the stability. Uh, yes, we know that the IPT has its quirks, uh, but I can't remember a time uh, that our instance of the IPT has experienced unfixable errors or a catastrophic meltdown, even after major updates have been installed. Uh, further, the fact uh, that it's so stable means that fewer updates are required. Uh, this is important to us uh, because A, we don't have a lot of time to fix software. B, the less we need to update and install software, the for us to make a mess of things. And C, because so many data publishers rely on our service. Uh, the second is that we like the simplicity. Uh, yes, we know that mapping can be tricky for some folks and uh, others, uh, for others, the metadata can feel overwhelming. But because we do the majority of the mapping for our publishers, that really isn't so much of an issue for us. What is an issue is that our resource managers can log in, go straight to the metadata, make corrections and updates on their own, and all with just a little bit of instruction from us. Uh, to us, that speaks to the simplicity of the tool for, for the majority of our users. Now, that doesn't mean there aren't some things we'd like to see in our IPT and the way uh, that our community uses the tool. Uh, one of those things is that we'd rather see fewer IPTs. Uh, not only is it easier on aggregators have to monitor fewer installations, it is also a net win for the community. So when a publisher uses the VertNet IPT, that is one less institution that needs to spend the time and money to maintain its own. And that adds up to a lot of time and money when you consider the number of publishers that use our IPT. In addition, fewer IPTs means fewer operating systems, security requirements, and server needs that GBIF has to address. And quite frankly, we'd rather see GBIF use its time on lots of other things other than finding a way to make one IPT function on a unique IT setup. Um, so this segues nicely into the second thing we'd like to see, which is the adoption of more shared IPTs across institutions, countries, and regions. This sort of sharing of resources has the added benefit of saved resources that I've already mentioned, but it also makes it much easier for orphaned collections to participate. Especially collections that have no GBIF node. The VertNet IPT uh, and the proposed GBIF regional IPTs are good examples of how those might work. Finally, uh, whatever changes are made to the IPT in the future, uh, we request that you please keep it simple. Right now, the IPT really has one primary task and that's to create and publish Darwin Core archives. We would like to retain this as the primary focus and avoid added complexities. 
such as vocabulary validation and data quality. We would much rather keep those sorts of tools separate. Now, uh, like many of you, we too have some nits that we'd like to pick with GBIF and the IPT, but we think in general that these are mostly minor. The first of these is that uh, is one that everyone who's ever used the IPT is probably so to be blunt. Can we please have an IPT that doesn't require us to log in twice every time? Um, I mean, it's it's kind of humorous at this point, but we'd happily give up the joke just to log in once. Uh, related to this, it would also be great to have a window longer than 15 or 20 minutes to leave a screen open so we can use the bathroom or brew up a glass of matcha without losing our work or having to log back in again. Just saying, Tim, nothing personal. Uh, our second nit is that we'd really like to see publication schedules remain fixed until the node manager or the resource manager changes it by choice. Right now, if a data set is published at an off schedule time, the publication schedule then resets to that new publication date and time. Um, when dealing with publication schedules for groups like Arctos, for example, in which there are, I think there are 114 individual resources in Arctos, it would be handy to be able to publish uh, and, and update those resources without having to wait until the first or second day of the month to keep them on the schedule. One small but growing nit uh, is that the IPT doesn't really accommodate different namespaces that contain fields with the same name, uh, such as the Audubon Media Description or Darwin Core IRIs. Uh, so it would be really fabulous if we, could, uh, if we could choose a namespace in some way and have the IPT map accordingly, rather than having to make these changes manually every time we go in. And uh, finally, um, our last knit is not really ours, but it's one that we hear, uh, hear about from data users and especially from the organizations that fund mobilization. We'd love to see the project metadata expand just a little bit so that projects with multiple funders, multiple funder IDs can recognize the groups that support their efforts. Um, further, it would be amazing if these IDs and even foundation or researcher names were searchable in an intuitive way. Um, Two minutes. Got it. Uh, as it is right now, uh, the experience of many of our users is that their division directors or local funding agencies can't just go to GBIF and make an easy query uh, to search for, say, a bid ID to confirm that various data sets have been published. Uh, if I may use this example on the screen here from the Kenya Wildlife Service, uh, what if this particular pr uh, project or data set was also funded by the JRS Foundation? Right now, there's no place for the JRS ID to go, and, since, and that's because there's already a bid ID in the identifier field. And certainly, there's no way to search for either the bid ID or anything that might be put in the funding text field. Uh, and similarly, no way for an interested party to go search for all of the data sets that Peter Hongo has, has published or, or, uh, or to look for his ORC ID. Uh, not a few people from the BID and BIFA programs have asked about this, and the JRS Foundation is not the only funder interested to find a way to link to and to track the products of their funding. So, to summarize our points, um, we like the IPT. We really do. Uh, but we also see some room for improvement. Uh, we want to keep the IPT simple or make it even more simple for people to use and we don't want to jeopardize the stability we've enjoyed over many years. So I uh, thank you for listening to me and now I will listen to you. Thank you David for an excellent presentation and uh, thank you to everyone involved in from the VertNet team um, over the years you've done so much for the IPT project that uh, I think a big part of the success is from the VertNet input. So thank you all. There's some wonderful discussion going on in the, the chat. Um, I'm hoping someone will come forward and uh, ask some questions. If the right question comes along, I might even turn my video on, but we'll see. Okay. Um, 
well, I would, I'd just like to throw it out there. I'd like to hear from some users. Um, we, there were a few users talking in the chat yesterday, in particular Jean Woods, and I don't know that she's here today. Um, but we have, I know from looking at the participant list, we have some other users on the list. So definitely would like to hear from the user side of things, um, your thoughts for um, IPT. Sharon? Okay, I'm gonna to remember to drop my, my, my little blue hand before jumping in here. Um, yeah, so I guess some of the topics in the, the chat have centered around um, <clears throat> data quality and where that should be checked. That was, that's one big um, issue for those of us as IPT users. Um, and I guess from my point of view, and I, I said it in the chat, the, the data quality tools that and checking pieces, the validators that are in the GWIF portal are fabulous. It's too late by then for us because quite frankly, once I've published stuff, I'm not going back to GWIF to check it, it's out there. So it would be great to have those tools up front because I don't know about other people's models, but certainly today's point, one, if you have a stable set of staff, you can actually train them to, to upload their own data and do their own mappings. And we've had a fair amount of success with that, especially as digitization projects come online. So I would love for them to be able to upload their data to, to Peter Desmond's point, create the Darwin Core Archive, and then look at the stats, go back to the collection management system, change things and do that. And then, as the IT department, it's our job to publish. So then I can just hit publish when they tell me they're done. And that's it, it's out there because I love all your aggregators and you've heard me say this before, but your end product is not my first responsibility because I don't have time for all of you because there's a lot of y'all and you want lots of stuff. So that would be one ask. Um, and then the other one that's going on, I think in there, is the um, the number of IPTs out there. Maybe that's a GBIF task to survey the IPTs and actually come up with a strategic plans for the ones that exist. Some of us do actually have really good resources that we can share in the community and are happy to. Um, and so doing something, okay, this is all the IT, IPTs, get them in a room and we come up with a strategic plan for who who helps who and how because you know, we can't always rely on free stuff. Um, and maybe that would allow resources to support the, the big free ones who are doing so much work in the community. There we go, now I'll stop. Thank you, Sharon, for uh, especially summarizing chat that's been going on. Um, yesterday, Peter um, presented um, an idea to do peer review during the publication process. So you prepare your data and then before you actually do the, the publish and then ask a colleague to look at it, um, he wants a, a new step that allows you to say, okay, it's ready for review. Someone reviews it and publishes it. Uh, we heard from Vertnet that they would like to keep it simple. We also heard yesterday uh, ideas of including data quality within the IPT versus calling out to another service. So Sharon, could you imagine a scenario perhaps where one of your um, employees maps their data, they've got the option to then uh, preview it, and that then takes them to an online environment outside of the IPT. It could be the, the GBIF uh, sandbox or something, where they can then uh, view their data, view maps, view charts, ask a colleague to, to review it and look, and have the colleague then say, yes, this looks good, publish. Could, it, could a workflow like that work in your institution, perhaps? Um, I think it's a good idea. I think it would require a little bit of um, finessing around where the actual click to publish is. Um, a lot of the problems that we have, and one of the things that scares me a little is having lots of methods of publishing data 
means it bypasses. I mean, we're lucky we have we have a team that is, you know, actively trying to help researchers get their stuff out. Um, so if there's some way for us to know that a data set got published after it went out for review, yeah, sure, that would be fine. That would take the burden off my department having to chase people. Okay, thank you. I'm trying to balance the ten or the difference between making the IPT do more and become more complicated as a piece of software versus um, supporting the kind of uh, publication workflow that Peter was alluding to yesterday. Oh, for sure. I mean, to Dave's point, the IPT has been around now for what, a decade? And it just kept it simple. And yeah, I love that it keeps you keep it simple. And if it had a second tool that went with it, that was, you know, connected with separate, sure. Because um, I remember version one of the IPT that tried to do everything and that was a nightmare. <laughs> hey, it supported Biocase. Yeah, we, we stopped doing Digger as well, all sorts of things, because we didn't, we couldn't do it. Okay, uh, thank you, Sharon. Now we have Beth with her hand up, please. And we have about two minutes left. Um, well, actually, I, I put my hand up um, while Sharon was talking and she covered a lot of the things I wanted to say, but um, uh, yes, yes, on the aggregator issue, um, we do love them, but um, we cannot, um, as an institution, support um, all of the slight niche um, requests um, from all of them. So, uh, you know, the Smithsonian's um, approach has always been to, um, you know, we put it out there in the Darwin core. Um, we have two major ones. We have the extant and the... Um, uh, extinct um, uh, versions um, and uh, you know you you take what you take it and um, oh I'm sorry I'm from the Smithsonian Institution um, Natural History Museum sorry about that um, and uh, you know we we provide that and um, and uh, so that's the subset aspect of it would be um, exceptional for us because we could put the onus on the person needing the data to um, to pick the data that is um, is uh, uh, you know needed for them because the other problem is is our is because of the size of our collection our um, our data sets are huge <laughs> and um, it's not always easy to um, to, to pull those down and parse. Um, so, so some way um, to uh, be able to do that and get the, the, the subset in, in the same format, it would be very, very helpful. Um, I had another question about um, the, the Burton and David's um, uh, issue of having fewer IPTs out there. Um, obviously the Smithsonian's uh, very large and we will continue to support our own IPT. Um, but one of the questions I had towards that is the issue of database connectivity, because, um, you know, if, if you, you know, you don't, we don't want to um, sort of open up uh, direct data based connectivity um, to to an aggregator or, you know to a, to another IPT source um, so uh, so there's there there's there would be that question and you know then would would they have to export their data out to you know to a format to then get it into I, into a separate IPT um, uh, publisher. So, um, so that was sort of a question as to how you envision um, that smaller uh, IPT services um, utility being used um, in, in that regard. So that's all I have, thank you. No, th thank you very much for giving those, those uh, perspectives. I, th I think we've probably got time to take one more, Laura. Is that okay? Sure. I mean, we do have a little bit of time left for open discussion at the end, so we can take a little time now. So Thomas, please, you have your hand up. I don't mean to tag team on my colleague, Beth, but uh, just a couple of questions. So Tim, I was intrigued a little bit about this, you know, being able to see the data before uh, it goes live. 
I think, you know, not having some sort of quality control just on the structure when it's uploaded uh, is problematic. And I, and I, I really, I think there's multiple levels of quality control, but I think that final step to make sure that you're, 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 you pass this like, basic validation rule would be really helpful. And I think that's something that should be considered as to keep it simple, but still as part of like your, your data you know, violates three or four of these fields. Don't go into too much detail, but just you know you need to go back and fix that. Uh, and then following on Beth, also the, the idea of direct connecting uh, gets complex because some of the scripting that people want to do before it gets loaded uh, gets more complex if you're trying to send that to somebody else. It's just a just a, a thought. So I, I actually push for more IPTs than less. Thank you, Thomas. Um, I, I saw Jean-Marc Vanel uh, put his hand up in front of the camera. Was, was that you raising your hand, please? Uh, yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. <clears throat> okay, so as I said on, on the chat, I am more on the consumer side of data than on the producer, and I never used IPT. Uh, I'm a specialist in uh, RDF and, uh, and semantic web, and um, I proposed to uh, turn the uh, um, jbif.org uh, API into uh, RDF using the JSON LD uh, technique. And so I made an, uh, an issue on GitHub uh, about 20 days ago and no answer yet. Uh, but maybe it's not the right place to discuss uh, jbif.org uh, uh, issues. I, I, I was getting a lot of private uh, messages there. Matt, could you comment on this one? I think you know about this issue. Uh, I, I haven't had time to look at the issue, um, but I don't think it's related to the IPT or BioCase as itself. It's main. It's a question for GBIF as an aggregator. So I think we should, uh, we, we'll answer that offline. Okay, fine, thanks. So, uh, so I, I just very quickly read that issue. I haven't actually read that issue before myself. Um, you're talking about uh, JSON and linked open data compliance. Now the third presentation that we have today is on frictionless data formats. And there are tools that can convert those formats into linked JSON. So I think we are heading in ways which might uh, sort of resonate more, uh, resonate more with your thinking. Um, but yeah, I, I think that's possibly a little bit out of scope for, for the BioCase and IPT discussion. And uh, we did have Ben with his hand up. Two quick things. I know we have a couple minutes. So uh, first, data quality. I, I know it, it's it's a very. I think a lot of people sort of gloss over, it, but the details are extremely important. We have an issue where I, I centralize all our data quality from our various collections in the sense that we, I want to make sure, for example, countries are published in the exact same way according to your standard across all of our collections. And so we have this model where we centralize everything through me. <laughs> so I have a lot of ridiculous amount of sort of you know influence over these things, and then we push it out to make sure things are consistent because a lot of curators don't agree on these types of things. But that's kind of the point. Data quality can get very touchy, right? Who, which one do you go with? Which standard? You know, as long as you go with the standard and then it's, sure, there's the minimum level stuff like making sure, you know, the basic standards are there. And I understand that, but it gets very hairy when you get above that and a lot of very contentious. And it's almost like something maybe outside of the IPT just because of that contentious and complex nature of validation. It's, all, it's a very, comp just technically also very complicated. Uh, three things about the IPT. It'd be nice to have more control over versioning system, a more detailed versioning system uh, to run. And I'm trying to keep things simple because like I build stuff to you guys and I know what you've done with the IPT is amazing, honestly. And I know there's a lot of people that use it. It's worked for years. I've been doing, you know, working with it, I don't know, I guess five years now. It's great. So I hate to sort of <laughs> nitpick at this stuff, but um, versioning system would be great, more advanced. A diff tool to run changes between data sets, just run a quick diff. Uh, generate reports, things like I want distinct values. And you can do this, I do this with Python, but you can run distinct values from every column. I want to see every value in the gender field. I want to see every value in the country field and just a quick report and outweigh just like that. And then a log when you guys harvest, like when GBIF comes in and gets my data, it'd be nice to have a little 
flag that says, hey, GBIF came yesterday and IDBio came the day before and this kind of stuff to see when things uh, go through. I got a lot of question mark curators about that kind of stuff. And so it'd be really important, but that's all. Um, thank you, Ben. Um, YouTube has a playback at slower speed. If anyone didn't catch some of that, because you <laughs> incredibly fast, but there was good points in there. Um, on the GBIF uh, admin tools, you can actually see all of your crawling logs as well. I'll put a link in the chat just so that you're aware of that. Individual but, ones. That's the goal. They have it when everybody comes to IPT and grabs it, right? Just little like harvest links or centralized. Yeah. That's all. Okay. Um, I think we need to, uh, it's been great discussion. Um, I think we should move on to the, the third presentation, which uh, I'm looking at my videos to see if I can and Andre, are you ready, Andre? I'm ready, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see that for the moment? Yes, we can see it. Yes, here. okay. So uh, my presentation today is about frictionless data. So. For my background, I'm, I'm uh, the node manager in Belgium and I have been using uh, different uh, provider software like Tapir, Digir, uh, IPT, Biocase for more than 10 years. Uh, recently, something like three years ago, I discovered the, the emerging uh, framework of uh, frictionless data and uh, I've, built, I've built a, a tool uh, in in that uh, area and i would like to to tell you a, a bit more about what uh, my experience with frictionless data and uh, with this tool so first of all what is frictionless data uh, it's a project from open knowledge foundation that some of you might know and uh, it aims to reduce the friction in working with data with the goal to make effortless transport amongst different tools, platform and analysis, which sounds like, well, this is more or less what we are trying to do with Biocase and uh, Darwin Core for a long time. Uh, and that's true. Uh, on, the, on the other side, frictionless data is also a progressive framework for building uh, data infrastructure, building data management, integration, data flow, et cetera. Uh, you have the, the, the link and you can, uh, you can do that, uh, of course, after the, uh, the meeting, whenever you want, if you don't know frictionless data. <clears throat> so basically frictionless data is, uh, is uh, twofold. You have technical specifications like how do I assemble my data. Uh, you have data package, which is kind of generic package for data. And then you have tabular data package with a kind of data package where you put tabular data uh, in a CSV format. And uh, to explain your, uh, your data model, you have a, a JSON file that describe uh, your data model. Uh, that's basically it. Uh, on top of these specification, you also have uh, different software tools like uh, libraries to access the, the data package. You have libraries for most of the current language like uh, R, Python, Go, uh, JavaScript, uh, Pandas, SQL, Julia, etc. You also have uh, some very nice command line interface on top of these libraries that uh, give you a lot of uh, possibilities uh, to not only to access the data package, but also to write the data package and to modify them. And uh, finally, you have uh, web applications like uh, Good Tables, which is uh, one of my favorite one, uh, but also Open Refine that can uh, deal with the uh, uh, data package and so on and so on. So uh, quite an, uh, a large ecosystem of uh, software uh, that runs on top of that specifications. If we compare now with Darwin Core, uh, I, I, I haven't made the comparison with Biocase, but because I'm more familiar with Darwin Core. Uh, so basically first uh, thing about the structure of the data in Darwin Core archive, uh, you have uh, the well-known star schema 
that some people love and other uh, hate, but that's uh, reality. In the frictionless data, you define your own uh, data model and you can have uh, any, uh, any uh, relations between your tables. So basically you define your primary key and you define the foreign keys in, uh, in other tables. So the, it could be a very complete uh, uh, data model with all kinds of relation, uh, including uh, relation to the, to the same table. Uh, so the schema in, uh, in Darwin core is, I would say, implicit because it's a core plus extension and everybody knows that. In uh, frictionless data, it's explicit. So you have a JSON uh, files that describes and explain to the data user what data model you have in your CSV files. Same for the types. In uh, Darwin Core, I would say it's implicit. When you have something like uh, latitude or longitude, it's basically you expect something, but uh, it's uh, more ex implicit. While in frictionless data, you can say explicitly, this is uh, a floating point uh, or this is an integer, it's a string, it's uh, something uh, like a Boolean or something like that. Uh, the constraints on the on the different uh, uh, fields that you have uh, again it's more or less implicit in the uh, Darwin core archive and different people have different uh, explanation while with the frictionless data you explicitly say the different constraint that you have so if you want uh, uh, for example to set constraint on latitude or longitude you can do that explicitly and uh, also a very important uh, thing is that uh, Darwin Core, it was made by the by the ST community. So it's very specific to that uh, community while frictionless data is uh, not linked to any particular domain. So it's very generic. Uh, and of course it doesn't prevent to, to explain uh, biology or biodiversity terms, but you can put anything else there also. And that's a great advantage, I think, because for example, we are dealing with uh, people and with projects and all these kind of things, which are not uh, basically or uh, very easily uh, described in, uh, in the Darwin Core archive. So in, uh, in a nutshell, in, uh, in uh, one minute, what is uh, frictionless data? You basically, put your data in CSV format and you describe your, uh, your data schema in a JSON, in a JSON file, and you put uh, all these things together in a, in a zip file. So it's very, you'd say, comparable to uh, a Darwin Core archive. It's domain uh, agnostic. So <clears throat> on the web, you can find a fiscal data package, for example, or climate data uh, data package, or any other uh, scientific uh, information. Uh, it's truly relational uh, model. You can have uh, uh, RDF typing, so you can explicitly say it's an integer, but more than an integer, it's specifically that kind of thing that I'm uh, referring to. And you can have uh, explicit types and constraints like uh, the, the one, I, the three example I have uh, here, the start day of the year, which is between one and uh, 366, the decimal latitude or the country code, which is a, a string with the two letters. I have here a very small example uh, of uh, part of a JSON for a specific field uh, within uh, uh, something that uh, is a core uh, item uh, of a Darwin core file, the basic, the, the well-known basis of record. Uh, it's a string and you can uh, have, you see the, the type here uh, that uh, links to the RDF uh, type uh, of the Darwin core. And then you have constraints, which here is an enumerated field with the well-known value, uh, preserved specimen, fossil specimen, living specimen, and so on and so on. But, Two minutes. Uh, yeah. Uh, you have nice tools that can run uh, validation and give you reports. Uh, 
and uh, last year I, I've been very lucky to develop a, a, a library that converts any Darwin core files into frictionless data package. Uh, so it's something like this: is taking JBIF data and putting it in a Darwin in a data package format. What is uh, missing for the moment is that uh, JBIF should, I think, be able to ingest this kind of uh, data. But that's probably uh, for the future. So my wish list for the next publication tools will be to be to have a widely adopted format with community-driven uh, development to be modular. So instead of having a big uh, piece of software that does everything, maybe separate the packaging, the validation, the reviewing, registrations, visualization, and so on. To be truly relational, uh, to be strict, which means uh, stricter than uh, the Darwin core for the moment, but also in, a, in the same time flexible. So if people want to add other entities or other vocabulary, they can do it. Of course, these data will probably not be indexed. Uh, to be linked, I would like the, the, the data package to be able to reference other data sets and to be referenced by others. Uh, to be annotated, like uh, Peter said uh, yesterday, I have a peer reviewed, like uh, we see with the iNaturalist observation, will be very nice and to be incremental, uh, have some basic tools and some advanced tools for an early adoption of different people. And my last slide here is the take a message, is a kind of summary of what I said. It's a generic framework, frictionless data, and it's more explicit and open than the Darwin Core Archive. So please, I would suggest to, for you to discover this, uh, uh, this ecosystem <clears throat> and the Darwin core tools I, I made uh, on top of uh, frictionless data to consider this for the next generation and uh, to for Tedwick more specifically to focus on entities, terms, vocabularies and constraints. And uh, finally, uh, uh, having some people working on the ingestion of GBIF of frictionless data. That was my presentation. So I'm ready for any questions that you might have. Andre, that was fabulous. Thank you very, very much. Um, I've been in Welcome, several yeah. presentations this week or sessions where people have mentioned frictionless while you were talking. Um, David Shorthouse was uh, pointing people to the outputs of the Bionomia work, which publishes its outputs using uh, frictionless data packages. So it's, it's very much a hot topic. Um, okay, a question to you. Uh, would, is it correct that we could um, move the Darwin core, core and extension definitions that we have now into frictionless data schemas and then produce frictionless data compliance outputs from the IPT in a very familiar manner to everybody, but making use of the frictionless schemas instead of the ad hoc Darwin core schemas that we've created. Yeah, that's basically the, the tool that I made last year and uh, it's just have to use that library in uh, in the IPT and uh, that, that will be it. Maybe you have to rewrite it in Java for the, the IPT, but that's a minor thing, yeah. <laughs> so before we del delve into a, um, lots of more discussion, I just wanna do a, a, an overall time check, Tim. Um, there's about 20 minutes left, um, so we can continue to take some questions um, regarding the frictionless data, um, or we can uh, just kind of go into open-ended conversation about the, the two days. And I will give a warning at five till. Thank you very much. So the, there's discussion going on on the chat. Does anybody please have a, a hand um, that they could raise to ask a question? John Wachorek's hand is up in the okay. chat. Since I don't, I'm not allowed a hand as a co-host. <laughs> um, so 
I love the idea of frictionless data, particularly in opening up the schema and in being explicit about data types. The issue that I see at first is our preliminary moves would either have to discard the majority of the data that are published because they can't fit the restrictions that we expect, or that the schema we use really actually has completely relaxed constraints anyway. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, I would support a more, uh, uh, more complex approach uh, with uh, some people using strict vocabularies and then therefore using this uh, constraint with, for example, on basis of records, but on, on many other things like lifestyle, uh, life uh, stage we discussed yesterday and all of these things. But uh, so that will be for the, 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 the people who already follow the, the, the standard vocabulary. But on the other hand, I would like to have some uh, particular communities that would be able to put their own terms and their own constraints. Uh, and uh, if, of course, the, the, the ingestion is, is still supporting that. So I see two things. One, a strict approach for most of the people, I would say, and then for particular communities being able to offer uh, alternatives to these fixed vocabularies. Thank you. Okay, while well, there's a pause, um, I would like to call on Matt Woodburn. So this is gonna change the topic. Matt Woodburn is leading the, uh, the Tadwig collection descriptions work. Um, and so this is uh, metadata for describing collections. The IPT allows you at the moment to document some very basic uh, collection description elements that came from the original 2009 uh, NCD standard, which was never ratified. And I would like to hear if Matt has any thoughts on what he would like to see uh, future tools provide in the way of uh, collections descriptions metadata. Yes, thanks, Tim. Um, yeah, and it's partly also to prompt other people here as to what they think they would like to see in terms of collection descriptions in there as well. Um, I, I'll, I'll caveat it that I haven't, uh, I'm not an IPT user and I'm not a biocase provider software user, so my experience is limited to local install of IPT to see what it does. There are some other people here in the task group who I think have a, a lot more experience at using particularly the IPT in anger, so I do welcome them weighing in as well. But um, some general, slightly unstructured thoughts. Um, as you say, the collection section in the IPT is pretty sparse at the moment. Um, what it does do is give you the ability to add in collection descriptions as a hierarchy, but it's that's kind of a, a layer below. You can do, I think, you can add a bit of metadata about your collection as a whole, and then you can kind of hang a, a bunch of collections off that. So the obvious thing would be that that would need extending to more of the terms in the in the kind of the richer collection description standard. But also I would see those terms as applying to all of the collections within that hierarchy rather than it being you know, a set of names and IDs hanging off one main description. So that, that that's one thought that I'd have to have a bit more of that structure. Um, there is also the point I think that Peter Desmond brought up yesterday. Um, we're likely to have quite a big standard, um, which is going to have a star schema of its own right. Um, but there's likely to be very little of that that is actually mandatory. So that point about being very clear about which elements um, are mandatory and which ones aren't, I think is a good one. But the, <clears throat> the relational database or the relational schema side of it is quite an important one. I, I find it hard to see how you could um, uh, put the CD standard into it in a flattened form in the same way that you have the center of the or the core of the Darwin core in there. So some way of managing that interface so people can, um, so abstracting most of the complexities of that, but allowing people to build up um, relational data around their collections within there. And that's where the, the kind of the fictionalist side of things actually sounds pretty 
attractive and also because um, I think there's a kind of a prevailing opinion from what we've heard that collection descriptions data should really source from CMSs ideally in the future and therefore having uh, being able to pull that data out of those relational structures into a publishing tool and be able to handle that um, that complexity would be quite useful so that kind of brings a point particularly is where collections descriptions would sit in the overall data model and I think the main point at the moment is that at the moment they're, they're kind of an aside attached to the resource or the data set but we kind of envisage them as being something of a layer between maybe the institution and the specimens so is there a way of incorporating that extra layer which might be hierarchical and have relationships in it but effectively you'd be able to implement a whole separate layer for people that both to be able to publish their collection descriptions but then associate them with the specimens within the specimen data sets because that's kind of the key part of being able to compare the non-digitized and the digitized is to have those linked up um, but can you do that and keep it simple because it only applies to the collections it only applies to the specimens and obviously the IPT also does observations checklists etc so how do we get this not getting in the way of other people's use cases but you know enable other people to um, people in collections who want to publish those to be able to use it thanks thank you Matt uh, I really appreciate that um, that we've got some people on the call. I was actually about to call on Thomas. He's put his hand up um, because there's people in the room who have collection management systems who are also publishing data using the IPT. So they're probably well versed at giving us input on how they would like to see this happen. So I would like to hear from others. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, I don't know uh, if you, how well you can hear me. Um, I had to switch my audio around because my batteries ran out of my headphones. So um, I think in general, what I see as really important to the whole understanding our collections process. And again, it is really about the, this is just about the collections. Uh, building and understanding from the specimen level to the lot level to the collection level is really important roll up and roll down for all of our collections. So having that level of metadata about the collection has limited, for example, this whole idea of one world collection where we can say, these collections are represented across X number of museums, they have these parts and they have all these components. So I think having those metadata definitely in everybody's CMS and based on that standard is something that I hoped happened you know, 10 years ago when or Roger and Carol Butler and other put this together. Uh, it just never happened. And, and companies like uh, Axial or uh, KEEMU never uh, allowed for those fields to be, well, they may now actually, I'm, I'm not part of it, but to be part of those standards. Thanks, Thomas. And we got Sharon with a hand up as well. Yeah, I can, I can dovetail off, off Tom and um, so, Field Museum are working with Matt and Deb on the collections description and that's very much where we're going. Most people know we have an IPT and we use it quite extensively. Um, and it seems to me that we need a way to, to simply publish data coming from our CMS. Um, and also in reverse, Tom, to what Tom said, if there is a standard and a standard tool that people are using, it's easier for us to go back to our CMS providers and say, okay, now there's a standard out there, it's, it's accepted, it's used, we can put pressure on you. And they, they've responded, actually Excel responded really well to that. We've had other pieces of um, other development in the CMS. So like re related resources, we just got that one through and there's a client wide upgrade coming to incorporate that. So this actually helps us go back to our CMS providers, um, but we're pushing forward. And I, I think in the same way that when you go in and you say, I want an occurrence call, some just a simple way that says, I'm actually, I want a collection description call that then gives you probably not all of the fields that we have, but at least the start. And also to replace some of the metadata, I think it would be helpful there too, because there are fields in there that cross across into, you know, and make it not seamless, but 
not too difficult. Thank you, uh, Thomas and Sharon. So you, you both come from very large institutions, um, Chicago and Smithsonian. Other, other people else on the call um, who would be interested in exploring what uh, Thomas and Sharon were discussing there, um, how to map into a collection management database um, to pull out descriptive information about the, the collections. I'm not seeing any takers. So I think I'm going to come back to, to you both individually on this with uh, Matt and Deb to explore it. I think Jörg wants to ask a question. Jörg, go. Yeah. <clears throat> I'd like to, to ask, um, are there, or, or how many of you do have restrictions on where to put your um, archive files or your exports or uh, whatever um, you produce um, when you're using the IPDs, probably the Urban Core Archive. So I guess um, there are institutions that um, this allow you to place it in some online repository or stuff like that. Let's say you have to keep it on the institutional servers. How many of you do have that? Ben, you raised your hand. But it was a, it was a response to the thing before you just what you just okay. said. So, but we do. We have to keep a copy. Our, our state government mandates so that we keep a copy on their servers, but that's all we have to have. We just have to keep a copy just in case there's World War Three, and uh, somebody has to get our literally like everything has to say a copy on North Carolina servers, or they get all you know been out of shape. But that's the only restriction in that case. Yeah, that's yeah. Um, I this is Laura again. I'd also be interested to hear from. Um, if we have people from other regions, Asia, South America, Africa, um, with your experience with the tool tools, with IPT and BioCase and your needs. Okay, um, we didn't get anyone coming forward. I'd just like to remind everybody that what, what we are doing is to start up an open consultation. There's probably been a lot of fast talking and lots of ideas going around that people will need to digest for some time. After this session, um, there's several ways that you can give us some feedback. You can open a discussion on the GBIF discourse forum. Um, if someone could put a link in the chat, that would be great. Um, if you would like to open a, a, uh, an open discussion on a point, you're always welcome to open issues on the IPT tool itself. You can always write to myself or Jörg or the GBIP help desk if there's things that you would like to express. So we are asking for people to contribute during the session but this is not the only place that uh, ideas um, can come forward. So please, please bear that in mind. The other uh, thing that I would like to ask this group is one of the ideas that we have is should the BioCase and IPT be merged into a tool? And we've had some wonderful ideas, lots of really, really good input from this chat. I think we've probably got about 10 pages of chat um, in our Google Doc to go through. But I wonder if anyone has any specific opinions they would like to share on whether these tools should be merged into one. Um, Peter here from ZFMK Bonn. Uh, maybe a stupid question. Uh, what does this imply, this merger? Well, as what it would mean is that we would be 
um, there would eventually be one uh, suite of software that we were working on together. We would have to go make decisions around that software together. What functionalities do people want? So questions around which interfaces and data formats should it support would be handled together. Um, questions around the simplicity of the tool um, or the complexity, we would be tackling that as an, in one discussion. The benefits though would be consistency, um, probably more capacity to support it. Um, and we would be able to bring our networks along um, together at a, a consistent pace with, uh, with more interoperability. So I can, I can imagine that the strengths and weaknesses, but for sure, when you start bring, broadening your, your team, um, there will be compromises that would need to be made. So I, I'm wondering if there's appetite from the community for us to start exploring this more. So this sounds wonderful. <laughs> Who should object against that idea and why? So the question is uh, rather not, uh, should we merge or why should we not merge? Well, it could mean that in the end, certain features of Biocase or of the IPT would not be um, present in the new product anymore, potentially. Yeah. I think um, Beth raised her hand. Thanks. Hi, Beth again from Nat uh, Natural History Smithsonian. Um, we have so, about five minutes um, left, sorry. No problem. Um, so for, from coming from a large institution with um, uh, limited resources, um, I, for us to not have to support multiple um, uh, applications, um, to uh, benefit our users is probably would be the biggest um, plus to emerge. Um, uh, we don't really have, we don't do biocase, but um, if biocase uh, has, you know, a, if there is a use for it, um, uh, it would be better for us to be able to, um, you know, merge them and be able to support more users um, in the long run. So that's that's sort of um, how I how I see that. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. And I think Deb also raised her hand. Yes, I would like to just say briefly. I don't have yet strong feelings either way. What I what I do hear that is exciting is this concept of alignment, of at least this, if projects and for example software developers talking to each other on a regular basis about what direction they're going in, what tools, what features they're adding, so that they can build features that both sides can use, or all stakeholders, whatever. But this notion of having an ongoing coordinated conversation in the development process of either tool, so that functionality can align with regard to products like the software formats or the API calls that, that can be made from one system to another, for example. So whether you choose to merge them or not, having a set up a mechanism for a regular conversation, if you don't, then it allows the kind of things Beth was talking about in my mind where different communities can choose the tool that suits them best, but they have access to the features of the other one. Thanks, Dave. And Sharon, please. A real quick one. I guess my question back to you, Tim, is are you merging the the tool or the standards, because the underlying standard on one is IPT, is Darwin Core, and one is ABCD. Um, I can see value in merging the tool and then having more options for output, same as you're talking about with frictionless data, but my question is tool or, tool or data standard? So Jürg and I are approaching this from a tool developer perspective. So having community input like this really helps us because we're techies and we're software people. Um, there has been another session this week about merging Darwin Core and ABCD. So there are discussions about just the overlap and the thinking between those two data standards. So BioCase bio is more than ABCD, um, I'm aware of that. 
but it's typically used with ABCD. So, so there, are, there are other discussions in the community about convergence. Um, yeah. I don't, I did, this is not a meeting where we're going to make decisions. We're, we're putting out ideas for people to reflect on. Um, yeah, I guess on a use from, from, as a user of the IPT, I, I don't really care whether you call it Fred or Hilda. And if I get more tools, great, as long as we maintain the simplicity of IPT and get some of the flexibility of, of Biocase. Well, I don't care what you do. <laughs> Just don't make it hard. Okay, thank you. Okay, we are nearing the end of the session. Um, we have two minutes and it's Friday night for many people. Um, I would like to thank everybody and just ask, does anyone have any burning questions they would like to, to pose before we just close off? Okay, um, I hope it's clear from what I said earlier, um, how people can contribute to this. Um, please do go away and reflect. Please do make your opinions and ideas known to everybody. Um, we have a, a very healthy community amongst here. And uh, I think we've had, had a wonderful week at Tadwig with lots and lots of good ideas. So um, please, let's all stay in touch. And uh, I just thank you to everybody. Thank you to Tadwig and to our helpers. And thanks to our presenters, Andrea, Niels, Peter, Peter and David. Thank you. Have a nice Friday, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye, everybody, and thank you. Bye bye. Salut. Salut. Bye bye. bye. Could we please stop the recording, uh, our admin? Yes.